in facts and not in wishful thinking. Mr. Vape, we'd like to ask you, is it really possible for a man to escape from this best of all possible worlds from this earth? Well, it certainly is possible, but at the present time, with our present lim limitations in engineering, it is not feasible. The cost would be exorbitant, and we would run into considerable difficulty in procuring the materials necessary for it. Well, uh, some German scientist like uh, Werner von Braun, who developed the German V-2 rocket, thinks that the space platform is the next logical step in uh, exploitation of the rocket. But in your look <coughs> article, I believe you disagreed with him. Why well, yes. Uh, for one thing, the space platform proposed by uh, uh, Mr. von Braun is a little on the impractical side, we feel. It is eventually coming. Someday the space platform will be built. But at the present time, um, the, the cost uh, for the amount of adults that would be achieved it would be far too exorbitant. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Vaith, the space platform is something that hangs between gravity and, uh, and the uh, force with which it would be propelled around the Earth. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Ken. Theoretically, uh, the principle of the space platform is to put an object into an orbit around the Earth. And the centrifugal force, which is trying to throw this object out into space, uh, counterbalances the force of gravity, which is trying to pull it down. Would, would one know that he was in, uh, traveling if he were on this platform? Uh, probably not, because he'd be above the atmosphere and there'd be no wind. For instance, if it were feasible for him to put his hand out of the space platform, he'd feel no breeze because he would be actually in a vacuum. Although traveling at what speed? Well, to put, an or to put a space platform or any satellite actually into an orbit around the Earth would require a speed of roughly 18,000 miles per hour. Well, Mr. Bates, how much progress have we actually made in uh, moving towards such a space platform? Well, we've made some, but unfortunately we haven't made as much as a lot of people can think that we have. I just mentioned that to um, put an object in an orbit around the Earth requires a speed of roughly 18,000 miles per hour. To shoot an object completely clear of the Earth so that it will go on, for instance, to the moon and never return would require a speed of roughly 25,000 miles per hour. Now, against that, those figures, which are what we must attain, we have only attained a maximum rocket speed of 5,000 miles per hour. So we have quite a long way to go. Well, we have reached the limits of the airspace around Earth, have we not? Well, we have. In 1949, a V-2 with a small WAC Corporal rocket on its nose was fired to an altitude of 250 miles. Now, for all practical purposes, that's the fringe of space. A small WAC rocket did not carry a WAC. Uh, no, it certainly didn't. But unfortunately, this WAC Corporal, like all uh, rockets that we have fired today, fell back to Earth. You may hear stories that we fired rockets which have never returned, but um, I don't think that's the case. Well, Mr. Vaith, uh, General Armstrong, the uh, Surgeon General of the United States Air Force, says that uh, medical science has advanced much faster than technology of space, and that uh, man could actually live in space if you could develop a rocket that will return him to Earth. Now, you think this can be done? I think the general is right. Uh, several years ago, I would say 10 years ago, for instance, it was thought that man could not survive in space, that cosmic rays, that excessive radiation from the sun, for instance, would quickly do him in. But the more that we learn about aviation medicine and the more that we develop protective equipment, G-suits, um, oxygen equipment, that sort of a, um, thing, we find that the fears and the troubles of space flight have been greatly over-exaggerated. Well, Mr. Baith, how much value would a space platform be to the security of our nation if an unfriendly nation managed to build one and send it out the outside of the gravity of Earth? Would this be the ultimate weapon against us? Well, Mr. Lesur, there has never been in the history of warfare an ultimate weapon. And I hardly think that, despite the fact that we are quite advanced today, that there will be an ultimate weapon at the present time. The space platform has as its principle for military use the idea of using a telescope to observe the surface of the Earth while this platform, at a height of approximately 1,000 miles, spins around the Earth at a speed so that it completes one revolution every two hours. Now, if you're using a telescope from a height of 1,000 miles uh, on an object below where you are yourself you and your telescope are moving at 18 or 17,000 miles per hour, it's going to be mighty difficult in order to pick out troop concentrations, uh, equipment, tanks on the ground. You might say, well, how about doing it by radar, by electronic means? Uh, fine, uh, you can undoubtedly build radars which will operate uh, fairly well, but there you're going to run into a problem of resolution. 
of being able to pick up targets and then after you pick them up to identify them. And I think perhaps the most convincing argument why we should not spend billions of dollars, and I emphasize that it's not a matter of millions, it's a matter of billions, maybe 10 billion, maybe 20 billion dollars to build a space station, that the most convincing argument is that the enemy is certainly not going to sit there and just take all this thing in his stride. He is going to be jamming your electronic equipment and your radar if you want to use it. And if you're using a telescope, if that happens to prove effective, he will certainly be making the greatest use possible of cloud cover, of camouflage, and of course of smoke. This is well, could the enemy actually shoot down uh, an opposing space platform? In my opinion, if one nation of the Earth is sufficiently advanced technically that it can put a space station in the sky, then another major nation of the Earth has a sufficient technical know-how to fire the necessary guided missiles which will home on that space station and destroy it. Mr. Wraith, this is of no conceivable worth as an offensive weapon. No, I can't see that, that it is. There is some discussion that perhaps it could be used to launch guided missiles. But I'd like to point out that if you take a conventional piece of ordnance and you want to hit a target 15 or 20 miles away, when it's right on the ground, and you're on the ground, it's pretty hard to hit that target. Well, suppose you try to hit that target from a, a platform that's a thousand miles away. Uh, in my opinion, it would be just complicating an already extremely complicated well, Mr. Bates, isn't it quite possible that uh, a space platform on which I presume we're working might have uh, peacetime uses? Isn't it true, for instance, that you could televise over half the Earth's surface if you get that far away from the Earth? The use of space stations, and it doesn't have to be a complicated space station, it could be a small uh, unit, say 15 feet in diameter, uh, the use of such a unit to transmit television and to use it as a radio relay station is perhaps the major scientific or practical justification of building an artificial satellite of the Earth. Now, you've probably heard uh, people claim that you can put telescopes on space stations and be able to observe the planets. Um, however, I would like to point out that we this year considered sending a telescope up on a balloon to observe the planet Mars, which is closer to the Earth this year than it has been in the past 13 years. And we discovered that we could not, even with a balloon, which is a fairly stationary and stable object floating at the top of the atmosphere, that we could not stabilize the telescope sufficiently so that we would obtain photographs of Mars better than photographs which have previously been taken. Now, if we found that to be true with a balloon, which is essentially a stable platform, I think that will more than be the case if you try to put a telescope on a space station moving at 18,000 miles an hour and completing a, an orbit around the Earth of once every two hours. Well, nevertheless, might it not be dangerous to the nation's security if uh, a potential enemy did secure a space uh, platform outside the Earth? Now, isn't it possible that we could uh, work a little harder to, to make one? Well, we could, but um, why should we do it when it apparently has no practical significance? Uh, I, for one, would like nothing better than to see somebody take off from, from Mars the day after tomorrow, but I don't think that we should wreck the national economy, divert manpower from, for instance, the guided missile programs, and turn them on this job of building a spaceship. I think we must use, we must consider it on a dollar and, and cents basis. One reason why space flight has not yet been achieved, and one reason why it will not be achieved for quite some time, is that we must consider the time element, and well, the money element particularly. I see. Well, as a space scientist, do you actually think that uh, visits to other planets are a distinct possibility, a real possibility I think in the that they future? Are, I think they are a possibility and will eventually take place as long as man progresses. And I think we must consider that man will continue to progress. What he finds on those other worlds is something we don't know. I do not think, however, that he will find any life, except perhaps some plant life which exists on Mars. No little man. No little man from Mars or Venus. In fact, there's probably no other intelligent life anywhere in the entire solar system. Well, you will agree, Mr. Vaith, that it's uh, just about time that somebody else discovered a new world. Of course, as we uh, often say, they said this to Columbus when... Well, when you read today's headlines, sometimes the discovery of a new world might seem quite an opportunity to get away Mr. from Vaith, it Mr. Vaith, may I ask you this? Uh, what is your opinion on these constantly recurring rumors about flying saucers? Do you have any opinion on those? Well, I think that as long as there are a number of sightings of strange objects in the air, sightings which have been made by competent observers, 
that we must keep our minds open that perhaps there are such things as flying saucers. They are two extremes of thought. Some people see spots in their eyes in the morning and say that they've seen saucers. Others um, say that flatly that there are no such things as flying saucers. I do not think we should take the extreme view in either case. I think that's pretty good philosophy to use in space flight as well. Well, do you actually uh, think that competent observers have seen things which are unexplainable yes. to a scientist? Uh, there have been a great many such sightings, and I think that we must uh, keep an open mind on them until these things are explained. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bates. It's been very interesting to hear you tonight. Thank you, Larry. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope are those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was J. Gordon Vaith, Space Researcher, Office of Naval Research. The worldwide reputation of Longines watches was not made in a day nor in a decade. It's been building for close to a century. Yes, since 1866, Longines has continually made watches of the highest character only and has acquired along the way the highest skills and the highest honors ever achieved by any watchmaker. 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in observatory competitions, a position of leadership in sports, aviation, and in science. In these magnificent Longines watches of today, discriminating men and women may find all the qualities they seek in a fine watch. Perfect timekeeping, superb appearance, unique prestige and reputation. And may I suggest that if you wish to buy for yourself or as an important gift just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world. Your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. And yet, you may buy and own, or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. And if you pay the price of a Longines, insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. <coughs> At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor.